Today on Cook's Country, Brian tries to crack the secrets of a beloved North Carolina dip fried chicken recipe. Jack challenges Bridget to a tasting of chocolate ice cream, and Ashley makes Bridget a classic version of North Carolina lemon pie. That's all right here on Cook's Country. We've fried a lot of chicken here at Cook's Country, but recently came across a killer version from Salisbury, North Carolina. It's called Dip Chicken, and the style was made famous by Benjamin Franklin Curidan Sr., who opened a burger and dog joint in 1942. The fried chicken on his menu quickly outsold all the other offerings, and the business became known as Frankie's Chicken Shack. Now, the chicken was in high demand, and Curidan needed to find a way to keep the pre-fried chicken warm for his customers. So his wife, Nanny Mae, suggested rewarming the chicken in a hot vinegary dip, which became their trademark. That chicken put Frankie's on the map, and these days, dipped chicken is a North Carolina favorite. Mm -hmm. And today, we're heading into the kitchen for a surefire dipped chicken recipe of our own. Unfortunately, North Carolina's most famous fried chicken shack, Frankie's, is now closed. And the Curitan family, who always referred to their beloved fried chicken sauce as the keys to the kingdom, never wrote the recipe down. Rather, they had key members of the family memorize the recipe. And Brian, you actually went down to visit Ben and Nanny Mae's daughter, Linda, to see if you could weasel some secrets out of her. Right, I'm happy to report she did not give anything away. She didn't. The secret's gonna go down with her. <laughs> but she was a wonderful woman. She invited us into her home. She made this wonderful chicken, set up the whole lunch spread, collard greens, baked beans, mac and oh, cheese, wow. all the way down to the sweet tea. Oh. She was wonderful, the food was great and the chicken was spicy, so. That's all you got, chicken That's was all I spicy. Got. <laughs> Were you like tasting it and trying to break it down in your head? Yeah, I was. The key to any great fried chicken is the brine. I have two quarts of cold water here, and I'm gonna add a half cup of salt and a quarter cup of sugar. The brine is obviously gonna help season the chicken, but it's also gonna help it stay moist during cooking. So I'm just gonna whisk this until the sugar and salt are dissolved. So now that's dissolved and we could talk about the chicken. We call for three pounds of chicken parts in the recipe. And the best way to get your most consistent chicken pieces so they cook at all the same rate is to break down a whole four pound chicken. So I'm gonna use the weight of the chicken to do a lot of the work for me. Ah, huh, interesting. So I'm gonna pick up the leg and I'm gonna make small incisions in the skin. Then I wanna kind of bend it back to pop out that joint. Mm -hmm. And then just let the knife run against the bone. There's a rule in butchering that you always wanna cut the bone and not the meat. So I'm gonna do the same for the wing. A couple of small incisions up there until you expose that knuckle. I like that, holding the chicken up and letting the weight of the chicken expose the joint. Nice. I've actually never seen anyone do that before. Same on the other side. Oh, I'm a fan of this. <laughs> now, you want to remove the backbone. So this is the full breast. We want to turn it up on its end here. And we just want to cut on either side of the breast to break through those rib bones. Mm -hmm. I also like how you're using two knives. We use one knife, a really sharp, expensive knife, to do the fine work of cutting through mm -hmm. the muscle, but use a very inexpensive or even slightly dull knife to hack through the bones. That way, you don't ruin your good knife. That's right, it's very important. So, we've removed the backbone. Mm -hmm. We can save that for stock. Now we're going to break down these parts into smaller pieces. So, with the breast, we're gonna go ahead and split it in half. So we wanna make a couple of small incisions all the way down until we hit bone. And we're gonna take our heavy duty knife, put some weight on the tip of the knife, mm -hmm. and pop through that breastbone. Then we'll turn the breast to the side. We find that by cutting these in half, it helps the breast cook more in sync with the smaller thighs mm -hmm. and the drumstick. So we're gonna cut this in half crosswise. It also gives you a couple more portions. Exactly, so a couple of small strokes until you hit bone, and the same method. You wanna put some weight down on the tip of the knife, and use the base of the knife to bust through there. All right, Julia, so this is one of my favorite cuts. It's separating mm -hmm. the leg from the thigh. If you look closely, there's a little line of white sinew running through here. And if you just run your knife straight through that, you'll go right in between the knuckle. You could use your good knife for that. And we'll leave the wings whole. Add all this chicken to our brine and we'll refrigerate it at least one hour or up to four hours. We don't want to let it go any longer than that because the chicken can end up being a little bit too salty. Okay, Julia, so the chicken's been brining for about four hours and we're ready to make our coating. Okay. We have one and a quarter cups of all-purpose flour here. And to that, we're going to add three quarters of a cup of cornstarch. This helps us achieve a more crunchy, crisp mm -hmm. coating. One teaspoon of baking powder. Which is unusual for fried chicken. It's gonna give it a little bit of lightness in that crunch. One teaspoon of granulated garlic. One teaspoon of salt. 
and two teaspoons of black pepper. Hooey! Don't be shy. <laughs> so we're just gonna whisk this together. And to create all those nooks and crannies on our fried chicken that everybody loves to pick off and leave the chicken behind, we're going to add two tablespoons of water. Mm-hmm, very okay. clever. We're gonna take this water and just rub it between our fingers till we create these little craggy bits of dough in our coating. You know when you make fried chicken and the last few pieces of chicken you batter always have a little extra coating? That's because all the water's come off the chicken before it. We're actually right. doing that ahead of time. So the first chicken is as good as the last. Now we can take our chicken from the brine and add it to our coating. So you're not draining it first or patting it dry? No, you want the chicken to stay a little bit wet so it lets that coating adhere. You really want to press this on and get a nice thick base of the coating yeah, on Yeah, you're it. really working it. Yeah, a lot of recipes call for you to shake off the excess. Yeah. Leave that excess on. That's all crunch. Save the crunch. I like to put them skin side up on the rack as well. Otherwise, they can get a little crosshatch pattern. Presentation side up. Right, right. Okay, Julia, and that's our last two pieces of chicken. That chicken needs to be refrigerated for at least 30 minutes or up to two hours to allow that flour to hydrate and really stick to the chicken. Okay, Julia, the chicken's been refrigerated for about an hour and that flour's had a chance to hydrate and really stick to the chicken. We've got oil set to 350 degrees here, and I know that because I have an instant read thermometer over there and it's actually reading a couple degrees over. Linda didn't use thermometers <laughs> for anything. Not to tell when the chicken's done, not to tell when the oil's hot. She just had a feel for it. She had a feel for it. We're going to add half a batch to the chicken at a time. A lot of people are scared of the hot oil. Mm -hmm. and they'll drop it from too high up and it causes it to splatter. That's right. So it's good to just drop it in and let it fall away from you. We'll let that chicken go for about 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And some of the thinner, smaller pieces of the breast and the wings, you might want to check around the 13 minute mark to see if they're done. For the white meat chicken, we're looking for 160 degrees, and for the dark meat, we're looking for about 175 degrees. All right. It's been about 15 minutes, and we can temp the chicken. Oh! <laughs> looks good, right? That looks so, amazing. This is a breast piece, and we're looking for about 160. On the nose. All right. So we'll transfer the chicken to a paper towel lined wire rack just to kind of wick away any of the excess oil on it. Mm -hmm. And then we move it over to the unlined side of the rack. So just a couple of quick turns. Right, because if you left it on the paper towel, it might get a little soggy. Exactly. We want to make sure that the oil comes back up to 350 degrees, and we can go ahead and add our second batch of chicken and begin frying that. And again, that'll take us another 15 minutes. Well, that looks terrible. <laughs> <laughs> My uh, mouth is really actually watering yeah, waiting right, for this. Too. We're ready to dip this chicken, but first we have to make the sauce. Mm -hmm. What I have here is one and a quarter cups of Texas Pete hot sauce. It's a North Carolina hot sauce. It's got a nice bite to it, but it's not overwhelming like a Tabasco sauce. So to that, I'm going to add five tablespoons of Worcestershire sauce, five tablespoons of peanut oil, and that's gonna give it this nice velvetiness that'll help it cling to the chicken. Two tablespoons of molasses. Mm. I think that's the only ingredient I probably got right from Linda's recipe. <laughs> and finally, one tablespoon of cider vinegar. And we can just whisk that together. And since our chicken is warm, we don't want to cool it down with a cold sauce. So we're going to microwave it for a couple of minutes. So if you don't mind passing me that lid. Uh, I like using plates as a lid in the microwave. I'm just going to hit this in the microwave for about two minutes. Even though it's called Texas peat sauce, it's actually been proudly made in North Carolina since 1929. And it's important to use this for North Carolina dipped chicken because it has a very vinegar sharp and not too spicy flavor that works in the sauce. We're ready to dip our dip fried chicken. So we have our hot sauce, and we can just go ahead and simply dunk. <laughs> I didn't think that chicken could look any better. You know how this dip came about, right? Goodness. Yeah, they wanted to keep the chicken hot. That's right. That's oh. the last piece right there. Are you going to drizzle that sauce I'm just going to throw this top? in the trash. Oh. Uh, you know, might as well gild the lily a bit and just go full bore right Goodness. over the top. <laughs> You are kidding me. This is both barrels of fried chicken right here. <laughs> oh, Brian, this chicken is gorgeous. And usually I don't eat fried chicken with a fork and a knife, but the sauce is making me pause. Absolutely no fork and knife oh, allowed. Really? Your, your forks are at the end of your arms. <laughs> Use those. I so, cannot hold back any longer. I don't recommend oh. you do. <laughs> the chicken is good and juicy. The coating is still crisp. And it's coated in that spicy sauce. I mean, man. I want to eat this in a dark room on the couch <laughs> with my shirt off. 
Mm. Brian, you nailed it. Well done. So for the ultimate fried chicken, start by breaking down a whole chicken and brining it. For a crunchy coating, combine flour and cornstarch with a little water. Refrigerate the chicken and fry it in batches using 350 degree oil. Last but not least, dip the fried chicken in that iconic North Carolina sauce made with Texas peat hot sauce. From Cook's Country, the not so secret recipe for North Carolina dipped fried chicken. The ultimate fried chicken, I should say. Only to vanilla ice cream. Today we're talking about chocolate and no longer the bridesmaid. Today it's the bride. It gets all the attention it deserves and Jack's here to tell us which brand we should be taking home from the supermarket. This is going to be fun. Yeah, I'll it's, say so. It's chocolate ice cream. <laughs> all right. So dig in. All right, no problems. Two things I want you to focus on. Intensity of chocolate flavor and there was some disagreement within the tasting panel about how much chocolate people really wanted. Do they want a grown-up chocolate or a milder, more kid-friendly mm -hmm. chocolate? Second thing is texture, which is dramatically different in these three samples. So the biggest factors controlling texture are one, the amount of overrun. Mm -hmm. So that's a fancy term for air. If they didn't add air, it would be very dense, almost like an ice cube. It can range from 30% air to 110%. Easiest way I think to understand this is we weighed a gallon of ice cream and a gallon of ice cream can either weigh four and a half pounds or seven and a half oh, pounds. Wow. Our tasters actually liked ice cream with a fair amount of overrun. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's because they wanted to eat a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's just half air, right? Right. It's yeah, diet. And, and you can actually eat more of it. That's it's a big healthy. Oh, it's <laughs> healthy. Yeah. But one of these is slow churned. Mm. So if you were wondering what slow churned is, it's actually light ice cream. The fat difference here ranged from three and a half grams all the way up to 17 grams of fat. And why that's important is not only about richness, but flavor. More fat means you're going to be able to have a harder time tasting the chocolate. And so it turned out that the mm. brands with the most fat actually seemed the least chocolatey because your tongue is being coated by all that delicious, wonderful, creamy dairy uh, fat. Dairy fat. The uh, studio audience agreed with the expert panel and chose our winner. Really? Um, it isn't actually the brand that I personally prefer the best, just to be clear. Interesting. Um, and it is one of the fluffier brands. I actually like this one the best. This one, I prefer a little bit more to this one. This one seems a little sticky. Some of these are made with sugar mm -hmm. and some with corn syrup. Corn syrup can give a sort of chewiness, mm -hmm. which again, some people love that. I'm still going to go with that one as my favorite, but I'm still going to eat all three. Are you going to do that now, or do you want to find out? <laughs> I'll so, find out. Yes, let's find out. So this is very interesting. The good news is we're in agreement. The bad news is we don't agree with anybody else. Really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> so you chose the haagen uh, ah. which is not the winner, according to the studio audience or the expert panel. It's interesting. A, it's a good ice cream, but it was not our top choice. I love it because I think the texture is just amazing. So this one does have a lot of chocolate flavor. This is Edie's, also sold as dryers in part of the country. Mm -hmm. It was at the bottom of the rankings because oh. it has least fat. It's slow churned. Oh, okay. Um, you can really taste the chocolate. That's probably the less fat. Yeah, and again, the talking. difference here is three and a half grams of fat versus 17 mm -hmm. grams of fat. So it's not like a little difference. No. It's a no. huge difference. And it had a little chewier texture to it. And this has pectin, tapioca okay. starch, a lot of other stabilizers because, of course, without the fat, you're going to have to add something to get ice cream texture. Right. And so this, I'm assuming, was our winner? This is the Turkey Hill. The studio audience Good chose job. this. The expert panel chose this. Good flavor. Again, it has a sort of lighter texture, mm -hmm. a little chewy. Mm -hmm. Our audience chose this. Our tasting panel chose that. But you and I are going to fight over that one. We're totally fighting over that <laughs> one. <laughs> well, there you go. If you want to pick up some chocolate ice cream on the way home, you can't go wrong. But our winner is the Turkey Hill Premium Dutch Chocolate Ice Cream. It retails for $2.99 for a quart and a half. We've made two or three or ten pies here at Cook's Country. We love pie, but today it's all about North Carolina lemon pie. Now it hails from the down east coastal plains of North Carolina, and the filling is similar to a key lime pie. It's also called an old-fashioned milk pie. That's where they cook sweetened condensed milk with eggs and citrus juice, in this case, lemon. Now the filling is great, but it's the crust that you will never forget. Instead of a graham cracker or a cookie crumb crust, 
It's made with salty crackers. And Ashley's here to tell us more about this pie. Yes, I am. Okay, so this pie, I'm gonna say it right now, is one of the easiest pies you will ever make. <laughs> Full stop. Full stop, that's it, goodbye. <laughs> and it is three things, it's sour, it's salty and it's sweet. It is so good and I'm really excited to make it for Cannot you. Cannot wait. Okay, so let's get started with the crust. Okay. So as you mentioned, it's made with some saltine crackers. Here I have six ounces, which is 53 crackers, saltines, <laughs> and that's a sleeve and a half of the salted saltine crackers. You know, every year growing up, my family, we would make the big trek down to North Carolina. We spent a week or two at the beach down there. And the seafood restaurants are all over the place, but you cannot find a seafood restaurant that does not include some sort of lemon pie. Mm. But also saltine crackers are always on the table, so oh. this makes total sense. Good. Authentic. Yes. Okay. And here I have one eighth of a teaspoon of salt just to drive home that extra salty flavor. But I want to mention it's not overpoweringly salty. You don't eat this if you don't pucker and eat a glass of water. Okay. It is just so, so good. We're going for balance. Yes. Like in life. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm going to pulse this until coarse crumbs, which will be 15 pulses. Okay. Right? And what pie crust is good if it doesn't have any butter? So let's add some butter. Here we have 10 tablespoons of unsalted butter, which I've gone ahead and melted. And this is one quarter cup of light corn syrup. Now this was really important for this pie crust because it helped prevent a pie from shattering when you go to slice it after it's been baked. Well, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, a lot of crumb crust pies, they use very dry ingredients, in this case, the saltines. So that little bit of corn syrup is going to give the crust some supple movement. So when you slice it, it's not gonna shatter. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna pulse this 15 times until it resembles coarse oatmeal size pieces. Okay. Okay, so here I have a nine inch pie plate, which I've gone ahead and greased. And I'm just going to pour these processed crumbs into the pie plate. Using the bottom of a dry one cup measuring cup, work in the center, and this helps to push the crumbs evenly around the pie plate. So that you don't have one really thick piece, one really thin piece, Everybody gets even slices. And if you notice, I'm just using my finger here just to help guide it, and just to also make sure that the crumbs don't go overflowing over the pie plate. Yes. I've gone ahead and preheated an oven at 350 degrees, and I'm gonna bake this on the middle rack until it's golden brown and fragrant 17 to 19 minutes. Okay. And I'm gonna bake it on the rimmed baking sheet. I smell crackers. I smell <laughs> butter and crackers. I smell butter and crackers. You are right, <laughs> that looks good. But does this have to cool completely? No, it does not. All we have to do is whisk a few ingredients together, pour it into there, and we're gonna go back into the oven. It's almost done. The rich texture of custard without the work. Exactly. Love it. So here we have one 14 ounce can of condensed milk, four whole egg yolks, one quarter cup of heavy cream. And this helped provide a little bit of richness and it helped cut through that really tart, sour flavor that you can find in a lot of these pies. And this is one tablespoon of lemon zest. Now that's a lot of lemon zest. It is. And we use that in combination with the lemon juice because if we used only lemon juice, it was just super sour, unpleasant really. And then one eighth of a teaspoon of salt. And I'm just gonna whisk that together until smooth. All right, now let's add that lemon juice, that sour element. This is a half a cup of fresh lemon juice, which is about three lemons. Whisk this until combined. So again, if we had just used lemon juice, well, we would have had to use a lot of lemon juice in order to get super lemony flavor. That's mm -hmm. why we have the zest in there. It also would have made it too wet. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's it. That's it. That's it. I'm gonna pour this into our pre-baked pie shell here. Again, still hot. Still hot does not need to cool down. Okay, it's done. Yes. All right, I'm gonna return this to the oven now and bake this for an additional 15 to 17 minutes. Now what I'm gonna look for at that stage is that the center is going to jiggle ever so slightly, but the outside is gonna have been just set. Okay, I'll get the door for you. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Sweet sugar lemon. And saltines. Yes. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I want to give it that little jiggle test. What do you yes, think? Yes, yes, yes. See? Jiggling um, right in the center. Mm-hmm. Set around the edges. So how long do we need to let it cool? We want to cool it completely at this stage, and then we'll transfer it to the refrigerator for four hours. Four hours. 
Four hours. Four hours. <laughs> All right, our pie looks good. It does. It looks set. I'm going to give it the jiggle test. Jiggle test. No jiggling. This thing is set. Nailed it. Almost ready to eat, right? Almost ready. We're going to make a whipped cream first, a whipped topping. So start by adding one half cup of heavy cream, two teaspoons of sugar. Lightly sweetened. Lightly sweetened. And a half a teaspoon of vanilla. And I'm just going to start whipping this for about one minute on medium-low until it gets nice and foamy. And then I'm going to increase it to high for one to three minutes until I see stiff peaks. Okay. I'm just going to check this. Oof, think of all the calories we save by not beating it ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice stiff peak. Nice stiff peak, yes. Now using this rubber spatula here, add a few dollops of the slightly sweetened whipped cream. Looks good. It does, and I love that you're not mounding it on top. This is all about that filling. And just a little soup song of whipped mm. cream on top. So fancy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and if you notice, I'm using a light hand here. I don't want to deflate that whipped cream. We just worked very hard on it. Yes. All right. Now I'm using a boning knife. It just helps give a little bit more control over each slice because it's really flexible. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I'm gonna take you back to your summers in North Carolina. All right, I can't wait to tuck in. Mm -mm. Well, Tides of Love, I think, would be the, <laughs> the title of this pie. That's amazing. It is full of lemon flavor. Oh, Have no doubt, but that little salty crust there. It actually has more of a texture than a graham cracker crust, yeah. too. <laughs> hmm. And that custard? I would have thought that somebody spent hours making it, but they didn't. I'm going to tell everyone you did. <laughs> It just tastes seasoned. It tastes balanced. Mm. You know, it's not an overly sweet lemon pie. It's a perfect lemon pie. Excellent job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm. Well, this might be the most perfect lemon pie, and it starts with an amazing saltine cracker crust. Pull saltines in a food processor, along with corn syrup and butter, press into a pie plate, and bake. Make an easy sweetened condensed milk and lemon filling and bake that in the crust until it's just set. It doesn't jiggle too much. Top with a little whipped cream and that is dessert. So from Cook's Country, the salty sweet perfection that is North Carolina lemon pie. You can get this recipe and all of our recipes from this season along with testings, tastings, and select episodes on our website, cookscountry.com. I may never make a sweet crumb crust again. Mm -mm. Sweet, salty, sour. Mm. Thanks for watching Cook's Country from America's Test Kitchen. So what'd you think? Leave a comment and let us know which recipes you're excited to make, or just say hi. Now you can find links to today's recipes and reviews in the video description. And don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you later. Alligator. <laughs>